Hello, my name is Rick Mehta. I'm a former professor from the Department of Psychology at Acadia University. After a 15-year career that was highly successful, I was dismissed for questioning my university's commitment to a political ideology. I thought that having tenure would protect me because a university is supposed to be a place where ideas are freely discussed, uh, but instead end up being mobbed by my colleagues. I thought that having union protection would help me as well. Uh, but in the end, my union did not stand by me. Uh, now, this in and of itself would probably be not all that interesting, but it's happening to other professors across this country. And so in this talk, I talk about not just my own experience, but that of others, and put into a larger societal context. I'm president of a group called the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Uh, the Society, SAS, was founded in the early 1990s. Uh, our concerns are freedom of expression on campus, academic freedom in teaching and research and service. And um, uh, we sponsor talks such as tonight's uh, and uh, a, a newsletter that appears uh, three times a year. And uh, we're uh, very uh, interested and concerned about uh, universities in Canada and uh, elsewhere, but particularly in Canada. Uh, so I want to welcome you to uh, tonight's talk, uh, Rick Mehta former psychology professor at Acadia University, will speak to us on safe space, uh, culture in Canadian universities, and assault on democracy. Rick. All right, well, uh, thank you for um, uh, hosting uh, this event, Mark. Uh, so I'm not sure how long this will take. I, uh, my estimate is probably about an hour and 15, and then after that I can just uh, leave as much uh, time needed for questions. So the library closes at uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, we have to we expect to be out of here at 8.45. I don't think we're going to need uh, that kind of time. Right. Uh, so to begin, uh, democracy works on the principles uh, that each person has one vote and that the majority rules. Unfortunately, might doesn't always make right, and views might, that might be expressed in, by only one or two dissenters often have just as much, if not more, merit than what the majority thinks is correct. So, for example, when I taught a course at, when I was at the University of Winnipeg, I was quite grateful for the many positive comments that I received in my course evaluations because they gave me information about what I was doing right. Uh, but I also remember receiving a single comment that stated that my giggling nervously while I was presenting sensitive material didn't exactly inspire confidence. So it definitely was that ouch feeling when you read that. Uh, and you might think, oh, well, it's only one comment. What should I do with it? Uh, but I thought, well, this might be just only one comment, but it's one that's fair and it's accurate, and it's telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong. And because I listened to that advice, it actually made me then a much better teacher in my career. So if we apply this example now at the societal level, large groups of people may have the same position on an issue, but still be wrong. So to ensure the society heads in the right direction, it's important that a democracy allow for voices of dissent to be heard. It's also in, uh, imperative that citizens be engaged about the important issues of the day so that they can make informed decisions about whether the arguments being presented to them are valid. Okay. So unfortunately, as Winston Churchill once noted, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Uh, by this, I think he was likely referring to the fact that most people that many people are often uninformed about issues that affect them. And additional challenges for dissenters is summarized by Bertrand Russell, who once said that a problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are often so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. By this argument, uh, because fools... Uh, we'll do the questions afterwards, so we'll, there'll be time for your moment at the end of the talk. Okay. So by this argument, because fools are more likely to express themselves it is harder for uninformed voters to decide whether the dissenter is a fool who's just shooting his mouth off or someone who's actually making a valid point. So often it's history and time that decides who's on the right side of an issue. So turning back to Winston Churchill, he argued that despite its pitfalls, a democracy is the best of the options that are available to us as citizens. When he said, no one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise, in de indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. So, now given that democracy is the best option available to us, 
it would be reasonable to ask, what is the best way to ensure that citizens are in a position to make informed decisions? I'd argue that a functional education system would be a reasonable response. So according to the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., who spoke about this type of issue in the 1960s, a functional education system should not only build people's intelligence, but also their wisdom or character. Universities have long been assumed to fulfill this role because they traditionally have been places where all ideas are discussed and no idea goes unchallenged. People experience personal growth when they have to confront shortcomings in their own logic, reasoning, and character, while also being open to new perspectives that they might not have been exposed to in their homes, elementary schools, or high schools. So now, while a lot of positive changes uh, occurred because of the social movements in the 1960s, there are also a lot of, but there are also bad ideas that were that have been adopted into our culture. So one change that I believe uh, that has had a big impact, but has generated a little discussion, is the self-esteem movement that started in and around the 1970s. So what happened was there was a relationship found between self-esteem and various measures of psychological adjustments. So I'll just use grades as this example here. And the relationship was interpreted as meaning that self-esteem, high self-esteem is crucial for high grades. So the idea was that if we build up students' self-esteem, then they would have high grades. Uh, however, this interpretation was incorrect. The relationship actually goes in the opposite direction. Students, students need to have high grades or some other measures of accomplishment or psychological adjustment in order to have a basis for having high self-esteem. Trying to build people's self-esteem when there's no basis for it has called a whole host of problems that we're seeing today. I'll focus on what I believe are the components of a perfect storm that's eroded our education system. So this uh, cartoon summarizes what many teachers have noticed has been one fundamental change to our education system. In the past, parents would have blamed their children if their children had poor grades. Uh, but over time, the culture has changed so that parents often blame teachers now. And so that's uh, something that slowly started to get uh, believed in the 70s and slowly over time started to take a life on its own. So over time, the standards have gotten lower in our elementary and high schools as teachers are often pressured to give passing grades to students who haven't earned them. The result has been that there's been a steady decline in the skills needed for students to do well in higher education. So for example, reading comprehension has decreased, which we can see as an example by comparing modern textbooks to those used in the past, with the modern ones often having more pictures than text. Another is numeracy, which is the ability to work with numbers or think in statistical terms, such as probabilities or percentages. That, too, has also declined. Sorry. So the combination, uh, this is my talk, not yours. Yeah. What you are watching now is one of many attempts by a former colleague to deplatform or silence me. So in what you're watching at this moment, what she's trying to do is questioning my academic integrity at a time when it's not appropriate to do so. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is my, my research in area. Do you not be able to source your material? Are you not an academic? Is it not? Let, 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 let Rick. But is it, is it not an academic? Let, let, let Rick give let his talk, please, and then. Can you then, ask a question afterwards, please? I think he should I'm be able here to source listen material. to the talk. You're insulting me. Well, Do you understand that? He should be able to source his material. To listen to this he's, talk. he's supposed to be an academic. He should be able to source his material. So why does he not have a source? You can ask your question afterwards. Right. This, this point, is common courtesy, Mrs. Curry. Sorry, I'm pissed off. I came from Halifax, from Warfield, to hear this talk. The normal thing is that afterwards you ask your valid question, but not in between. I'm sorry, I also came to see the talk. Right? Yeah, then be quiet so we can hear. I'll, I'll You're the one being loud well. right now. I came to hear, I came to hear Rick talk. Okay, so, I mean, you did, so norm. Don't just. Okay, so numeracy then, which is what I was saying, which I was saying, the ability to work with numbers and think in statistical terms, such as probabilities or percentages, has also declined. So both of these skills, reading comprehension and numeracy, are crucial for people to be able to evaluate information critically and to be able to think rationally. Okay, so in addition. Uh, many of the books that were considered essential reading are no longer covered in many schools. For example, many of schools have now stopped assigning books like To Kill a Mockingbird because it contains racist language that was common for the time period in which the book takes place and because the book was written from the perspective of a white girl. 
There's also less emphasis on courses that build life skills, such as home economics, where students learn the basics of how to cook, mend clothing, and other tasks that are essential for managing a home and for being able to be independent. And so on the side of being independent or disciplined, having self-autonomy, I've noticed that potential students, when they come into the universities, they come with their parents, and it's often the parents who are doing the asking all the questions and, uh, and uh, for the students while the students just sit there passively. <coughs> So as the standards have gotten lower in our elementary and high schools, uh, universities around the 90s started to adopt a corporate model, and at these day and age, they've pretty much become degree-generating factories. As each year of um, incoming students has less of the skills needed to succeed in the universities, the universities have responded by putting pressures on the prof professors to lower their standards. An additional complication is that the hiring process in academia seems to select for people who will not rock the boat, and hence, therefore, not dissent. So a final piece of the puzzle is that the political composition of uh, the professors in our universities has changed dramatically over the past few decades. I'll present data from the US, but I believe that similar results would be observed in other countries in the Western world. So this graph, which is by the Heterodox Academy, shows how the ratio of far left and liberal professors, so that's the uh, blue line here, this line here, uh, to conservative professors, the far right or uh, conservative, which is the red line, uh, has changed from two to one in 1989 uh, to six to one in 2013. However, a more recent study suggests that the data in this graph is actually an underestimate. Uh, so from uh, this study that was done in 2018, uh, this looked at the ratio of um, Republican and, um, and Demo the Democrats to Republican professors across various faculties. And so engineering, which is often thought to be traditionally a very conservative field, that has a ratio of 1.6 times more Democrats to Republicans. Okay. And if we look at a field like mine with psychology, that ratio is about 17. Uh, and even degrees like math, which you might expect to be a bit more rational and uh, therefore more based on facts rather than on, uh, on issues related to, um, to, to politics, even there it's a ratio of um, roughly uh, 5.6. And the ratio has increased, so as you go into the arts, you're talking the range of uh, almost 50, uh, just to give you a rough, uh, rough idea. Okay. And so you might think then on the one hand, okay, the, uh, maybe what's happening in our professoriate is just mirroring, mirroring what's happening in society. Uh, but that actually is not the case. So it seems that there is a documented political bias uh, within certain fields. So it seems to be within academia, for one, uh, print media, newspaper and print. So if you kind of think about who coined the term uh, fake news, uh, who is the one to say that truth has a liberal bias, that all came from the media which tends to have itself a very sort of left or liberal perspective. Entertainment industry, big tech. So those are the ones where there's a documented political bias. Uh, but this is not something we see in other parts of society where there's far more diversity in uh, political perspectives, with these three just being a few examples. Okay. Uh, so in terms of the changing face of the universities is that now, instead of being places where you have the free, free exchange of ideas, and using free inquiry now to seek truth, they're now become uh, places where they seek social justice. And so this is something you can expect when you have a whole group of people who think the same way. Uh, so this provides the ideal breed, breeding grounds now for uh, power dynamics where you're gonna have more extreme views taking hold and where more moderate views then are gonna be suppressed. And so what I've written here is that we've changed the mission of the university now from seeking truth through free inquiry to uh, committing ourselves to a social justice ideology. And so when I use the term ideology, I'm using that actually very specifically. So usually in that field like science, we're trying to figure out, okay, well, what would I expect if I'm on the right track? But you're also trying to keep in mind, well, what if I'm on the wrong track? Uh, when you have an ideology, it uh, sets itself up so that no matter uh, what you say to it, you can't question it, it can never be proven wrong. And so that's what makes, uh, makes a perspective an ideology as opposed to just say another uh, theory or a different viewpoint to be discussed. Uh, so I'll just use this one example, the pyramid of white supremacy, which is used in some schools. So according to here, how this pyramid works is in the pyramid, every brick depends on the ones below it for support. If the bricks at the bottom are removed, the whole structure comes tumbling down. 
Okay. And so in terms of what's thought to be a support for white supremacy then, is if you say, well, I have a black friend and that book, you know, someone who's black, they don't really think that, that would be considered then support for white supremacy. If you say, well, there's multiple sides to a story. Uh, let's maybe look at intention over impact. Okay. Um, yeah, we're all a human being, so like Martin Luther King would have said. So all of these then, if you try to use those as arguments, they'll say, well, when you say that, that's just another form of white supremacy. You're just inherently believing it. So no matter what you say, uh, you cannot ever disprove then this pyramid. Okay. Uh, so we look at the psychology of social justice. So how is it that uh, the advocates for it uh, think and process information? Uh, so one is that the way they conceptualize the, world, conceptualize the world is on the basis that there's no objective truth or an objective reality. And so basically you have uh, individuals that are all living in their own little bubbles and there is no actual objective truth. So if that's the case, uh, what do you use to mirror or to, to anchor yourself? What is it that actually keeps you grounded? There's actually nothing for that purpose. So in essence then, what that leads to is the absence of the ability then to self-correct. There's no reason to ask yourself, am I on the wrong track? So you're fully confident in your beliefs. Uh, the empathy is not there that, okay, if I'm talking to someone, they have a different perspective. Well, maybe there's something to what they say. So those kind of things, those kind of perspectives are gone altogether. And so I'd argue that uh, this way of thinking then you know, basically suppresses then all the higher brain regions, which are involved in the really important functions like uh, judgment, decision making, having filters, so you know when to be quiet as opposed to just when to speak. So those things are all tend to fall by the wayside. Okay. Uh, then to that, then we can add that when we uh, ask about the reasoning, it tends to be based on emotion rather than fact. And that was something that we saw on the previous slide, is let's look at the impact of what happened and not intentions. So the idea is that if you're offended, uh, intentions don't matter. We just look only at the outcomes. And so uh, this line of reasoning where you base all of your decisions and your main mode of thinking based on emotion, uh, this ties into our lower brain areas, like the limbic system, and those, are, those play an important role in pleasure, but also in perceiving threat. And so we might ask ourselves, well, what is, the, what is it that's now going to be a threat to me that's going to make me want to become aggressive or attack? Okay. And that would be then identity politics, which is basically uh, a form of, well, I'd say it's a form of tribalism, going back to uh, what happened in our past with our, uh, uh, with our um, caveman ancestors. So basically the way it works here is you break society down into groups and it's based on inborn characteristics, things that people have no control over, like their skin color, uh, their gender, uh, uh, their sexuality, so those kind of things. And so then you can look at them individually or in these various combinations and those then are arranged into a power, power hierarchy, uh, like the white supremacy one I mentioned. And so in terms of evidence for this, uh, there was uh, one audit done in Australia. And so there they came up with a report called The Rise of Identity Politics. And uh, they audited the history curriculum at the universities in Australia. Okay. And so what I found interesting then is here is the pie chart then looking at the curriculum. And by far the greatest proportion of the curriculum is devoted to identity politics. So that's more than Australian history, other forms of uh, history in Western civilization. So you can see that's by far the biggest chunk. Okay, now the, um, the, the right-hand panel now shows uh, the keywords. So the key point there is the most frequently employed keywords in the titles and subject descriptions from things like course outlines uh, reveals the predominance of identity politics in the teaching of history at Australian universities. So if we look at the top three, it's going to be indigenous, race, gender. Okay. And if we kind of go down, what I found interesting is that Islam has a higher place than Christianity. And democracy is just here with 21 keywords compared to roughly 100, let's say, for indigenous. Okay. Uh, so we might ask then, okay, well, based on the psychology of social justice, then what is it that they're uh, hoping to achieve? Uh, so the first is basically the triad that's, that that's known as equity, diversity, and inclusion. So what equity refers to is a quality of outcomes. And that's different from equality of opportunity. So equality of opportunity is that, you know, that you're not uh, rejected from a job based solely on your skin color. So you have the same opportunity to apply. Your application will be given the same 
uh, due respect as anyone else's and not based on anything that's irrelevant to your ability to do the job. Uh, but with equity, it's the idea that we look at what our uh, society looks like and look at their breakdown on things like race and whatnot. And that has to be mirrored in every element, so in politics, the university, and every field. And if there isn't, then supposedly there's this big problem that needs to be addressed. And the only explanation that's, uh, that's considered valid is systemic discrimination. So the idea that maybe some people have different lifestyle preferences or get pleasure from doing different tasks or have different skill sets uh, seems to go by the wayside. And so in terms of how it's uh, marketed, is that equity is supposed to be that we find the people who, through no fault of their own, have had an unfair shake in life, and we try to build them up. Uh, but in practice, what it actually does is it takes the people who are at the top of this, um, you know, who generally people who are more successful, and tries to bring them down to the people who are the least successful. So it's actually anti-democratic, because it's going at the majority and saying, they're oppressors, let's bring them down to our level. And you can see that in the types of language that, the, that they use. So words like white privilege, uh, cisgender, heteronormative, ableist. So basically different ways to talk about the majority who often tend to be successful, uh, while using words like marginalized then to describe uh, other people. So it sets the world up into an us versus them. And the idea is not how can we build, uh, set up the world so everyone has sort of a more or less equal footing, but how can we tear down the majority or people who are successful? Okay. Uh, then the next component is diversity. And so there's the idea that we must have diversity in cultures and uh, genders and uh, skin colors and things like that. Uh, but the one thing that's excluded is diversity of thought. Okay. Uh, then there's inclusion, and that's the idea is that if we're having a classroom setting, every single person in the class must feel included. And so as soon as even one person feels, does not feel included, then discussion must stop and we can't talk about those topics. And so the way it works in the uh, university system then is that if a student feels offended, uh, that feeling of being offended is sufficient then to violate the harassment and discrimination policies. And so then professors are then told, okay, well, you can't talk about those issues. And so that then leads into what is safe-based culture. And so basically what it boils down to is that views that contradict or aren't in line with that of social justice then are defined as constituting hate speech. Or that people say that when you talk about uh, views that are outside of uh, views that I agree with, uh, you're causing me to feel uncomfortable, harm, or that's traumatizing. And so if that's the basis of safe space culture, the idea is then, in order to feel safe, we have to reduce then the number of views that can actually then be discussed in the university setting. Okay. And so what's unique to Canada then, compared to, let's say, the US, um, is that uh, the most majority of professors in the Canadian universities are implied in uh, unionized workforces. Uh, so in terms of when it comes to unions, uh, they are really good at marketing. I'll give them credit for that. So they market themselves as defenders of workers' rights. Uh, but what they actually do in practice is that they're a regulatory arm of management, and their function is to actually keep workers in line. So they're actually doing, they market themselves one way, and what they do in practice is actually very different. Okay. And so in terms of what's unique to Canada and with unions is that dues are mandatory. Uh, so with most unionized workplaces in Canada, you can say, I don't want to have a union membership card, but your dues will still be taken off your paycheck anyway. Okay. And so if there is a dispute then between you as a member and the employer, then the union actually has full carriage or full jurisdiction on the case. And so they can do what they like, and there's not even a duty to consult with the members, let's say, with the direction of how we're going to handle the dispute. So what they, they basically come to boss and decide how things are going to proceed from there. And so what's interesting about uh, labor law, then, is that the principles that you see in other areas of law uh, do not seem to be applicable in labor law. Uh, so here, conflict of interest is fully acceptable. Uh, so in my case, as an example, uh, the investigator for my case, Wayne McKay, uh, happened to have worked in the law firm of Ron Pink, who is the union lawyer representing me. And in the past, Ron Pink had given uh, legal advice to McKay when he was the president of Mount Allison University. Okay. Uh, so their conflict of interest is just brushed aside. It's not even considered an issue to, be, to deal with. 
Uh, presumption of innocence is another rule that's also not applicable. So you could have someone who's uh, worked in, in the company for something like 30 years. It could be weeks then before retirement and their employment get terminated. They'll talk to their union and a union might say something like, well, there's a, you know, you've had an illustrious career. There's no way they would just terminate you for no reason. There must have been something you've done wrong here. Uh, so that's the approach that they'll take. So the whole idea of presumption of innocence goes by the wayside. <coughs> Now, uh, if you are fortunate to somehow have a hearing for your case, because the unions aren't obligated to actually provide one, so if you do have one, they're typically not recorded, and um, or they're and or they're not open to the public. So it happens in private settings. There's no record what happens. A uh, person who's doing running the hearing can do what they like, and there's no type of transparency or accountability there. And so the arbitrators who um, who run these uh, hearings or who end up trying to resolve the uh, resolve your case, um, you generally expect to have a 50-50 record of siding for the employer versus the union, even when there's a so-called dispute now between the union and employer. Okay. And so in terms of what I'll go to now in terms of examples of this, is I'll look at uh, the union's role in suppressing academic freedom. So one way is by omission, where you might expect a union to perform actions and they don't. So look at three cases, Paul Valley at Uni Ryan Ryerson University, Derek Pine at Thompson Rivers University, and Ricardo Duchesne at the University of New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. uh, one, the commission where they do something to try to de-platform someone. Uh, so I'll use the example of Jen Kent Smith, uh, who is a speaker at the University of British Columbia. And then how you can have a combination of both tactics, uh, which will go into my case. And so with uh, Paul Valley, to give uh, some background, uh, so he was someone who taught on a contract basis at, um, at, in, at the Department of Philosophy at Ryerson University. So uh, he's someone then, if you're on a part-time basis like that, every year you have to put your contract in, you always start from square one. So unless you have a good record, typically you're not going to be rehired from year to year, uh, just because that is the true uh, precarious um, uh, employment. That's one that unions like to market themselves as saying, yeah, we are the defenders of the, the part-timers. And so he had a really strong record. And so what happened in his case is that he wrote a reference letter for a student. Uh, so this is a student who'd gotten into graduate programs in the past. So it's not like uh, this was a case where this is a really strong student with a stellar record who's getting rejection. So it's nothing like that. So this uh, Dr. Bally then wrote a reference letter for a student for a PhD program. So what happened was Professor A at one of the universities disagreed with the style of the letter and then complained to Professor B at another university. So let's say for this example, Professor A is in England, complains to Professor B in the States. So then Professor B emails the chair of his department, and so in January, at this beginning of the year, uh, his chair informs him that there's a complaint now from, uh, about that letter, and it turns out then it was from Professor B, not even from Professor A. Uh, so then he asks, well, what exactly is the problem so the response, the response the chairs gave him was, well, apparently, not always helpful. It does not read well from the point of view of gender somehow. So this is not really all that helpful as a response. You'd expect something, something really specific. So he was trying to do his best to uh, you know, advocate for himself and say, like, what is going on? What actually is the problem here? Uh, so in March 2019, uh, the chair of his department then gets human resources involved and demands that Dr. Bally now turn over his reference letter. And so there's basically no real rationale for doing so. And if anything, you could argue this is his uh, intellectual property. It's a confidential document. And so there's no justification for him to have to hand over his reference letter. Okay. Uh, so he ended up sticking his ground and saying, I'm not going to do this. I think this is immoral and unethical of what you've asked of me. So he ended up getting a one-day suspension without pay for refusing to hand over the reference letter. Uh, basically, that's then classified as insubordination. I think he was also told, oh, you use rude language to the chair. That's not acceptable. So, uh, so that was the basis for that. And then when he applied for his job in June, he ended up uh, getting rejected. And so basically what happens is that, ref that uh, letter of insubordination uh, takes away then from the number of points that you'd need for your application to be successful. And so then uh, that, in fact, is a way of uh, terminating someone's employment, but without actually creating a record of that. Uh, so we might ask then, well, what was his uh, union's role in this? Was there any talk of solidarity? 
workers' rights or anything like that. Uh, now, the standard line, though, when, uh, when you have a, a dispute or a grievance with your employer is they'll say, well, just uh, comply now and then grieve later and we can figure it out after the fact. So in a case like this where we're dealing with a confidential document, and it's not going to be all that helpful for him to pass it over to his boss now and then complain about it afterwards because now the confidential information has been released. Okay. And one thing that he was told, and this comes up with many people when they've had uh, disputes with their unions, is they're told that the union's job actually is to keep the peace in the workplace. So if they're not there then to advocate for you. So there was definitely no talk of uh, solidarity or trying to take his side at any point. Okay, so that's one example of uh, omission. So now we'll turn to Derek Pine at Thompson Rivers University. Uh, so he's a tenure professor in the School of Business and Economics. And uh, he started there in 2010. Uh, so what happened was in April of 2017, uh, he published a paper uh, in which he reported that half of the colleagues in his school were publishing papers in what are known as predatory journals. So basically the way they work and why they're a call that is that uh, you submit, uh, you, uh, they put out a, you know, a call for papers or something like that. The key idea is you pay money to have your work published. And so most self-respecting universities are not going to look at uh, someone putting that on their resumes as valid publications. Uh, but he thought, well, a place like some of these smaller universities where they're not always going to be at the same level as, uh, you know, like the University of Toronto or something like that, probably as you say, not, it's not really a self-respecting university. Uh, so he had the idea that uh, by economic incentive theory, if uh, my university allows those to be considered as legitimate publications, there's now incentive now for uh, professors to have their work published there. So you spend a few bucks, you get your publication, uh, you can then really pad your resume that way, and then use that as a basis now for getting promoted and getting uh, internal research grants. And so then he found that half of his colleagues were, uh, were doing that. And so even though none of the name of the institution wasn't named, none of his colleagues were named or anything like that, eventually I think people could figure out who he was referring to. And so he ended up being suspended and banned from campus. And so the reasons that he was given then was that there was defamation of the institution, um, which of course, if the information's true, you can't be defaming your institution, and also then def defamation of his uh, colleagues. Okay. And so with something like that, if there is defamation between colleagues, they do have mechanisms. They don't need to go through the university to handle that kind of a dispute. Uh, the other thing that came up, though, which I found interesting, and going to the idea of what safe spaces might refer to is, uh, his colleagues said that they were afraid of him based on what he had to say. Uh, so another way I, we can think we can look at what safe spaces means is that for people who are in power, uh, they don't feel safe when they have their power questioned. Okay. Uh, so he ended up being able to be reinstated back in January of this year. I imagine that his workplace and the work environment is probably not the most comfortable place to be in. I imagine he probably goes in, does his work, leaves, probably doesn't spend too much time with the colleagues and that kind of work environment. So we can ask ourselves, so what were the union's actions? And so they did what they're required to do, so they filed grievances for a suspension. Uh, but there wasn't any active support, which is something you might expect from your union. So in past cases, if, uh, you know, if the, the administration was going after one of the professors, the the unions would actually stand up and give out letters of support. There'd be statements to the public, maybe rallies or anything like that. But there was nothing like that for no, no outward expression for Dr. Pine's academic freedom, so no support along those lines. Uh, there was also no protest of any form from the union uh, when about the union, the university's, I'd argue, inappropriate demand that he have and undergo a psycho psychological evaluation. So now the third case I'll talk about is that of uh, Ricardo Duchesne. Uh, so in terms of his background, he's uh, actually an immigrant from uh, Puerto Rico, I believe, or Portugal, one of those two countries, blank in my, my mind right now. And so he's been at the uh, University of New Brunswick now for 24 years, uh, had a very, uh, you know, very um, established career, so he won't be at a university that long unless he had a strong record. And from what I can tell, based on his teaching, uh, stellar records, his research obviously would have been at a, in a research census institution, unless he had a strong record. So and his ability to get along probably was fine for all these years. 
so in 2017, he wrote two books uh, that were critical of um, multiculturalism in Canada and based on our policy and how is it that we're actually uh, deciding who we have to allow into our country. So there are two books and basically they went by with a little fanfare uh, until earlier this year where there was a hit piece in the Huffington Post where it alleged that he was a white supremacist and it had nothing to do with any of his arguments or anything like that. It was just basically a bunch of allegations with uh, minimal supporting evidence. <coughs> Uh, so once that was released, it started to take on a life of its own. So uh, a little while later, uh, roughly 113 of his colleagues uh, wrote a letter in which they condemned him. And again, it wasn't based on any of his arguments, which if they were baseless, they could have easily been refuted. Uh, the student union at his institution also made a public statement uh, denouncing him. And as well, the Canadian Historical Association uh, released a document in which they denounced his work completely, saying, oh, we want nothing to do with him whatsoever. Okay. And so instead of the, uh, un the university trying to defend academic freedom, uh, they ended up uh, forcing him then to retire. Uh, so basically he took uh, an early retirement package, and the details are confidential. Uh, so in terms of what it might be, what we might speculate, uh, so I know within our own institution, uh, a few years back, uh, one of my colleagues was really stressed out and I asked him what's, uh, what's, what's wrong. And he was saying, well, I have to decide, should I take this $100,000 carrot that the university is trying to give me to retire, or should I stay on as a full professor and make more than 100000 a year? And so I just uh, bowed out of that conversation because, yeah, I'm inside I'm just thinking, yeah, cry me a river. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what could be a sort of at the low end. Um, with Jan Wong, who was a... Um, columnist with the uh, Globe and Mail, uh, she, her package ended up being uh, 200000 I think 100000 a year for two years, but because she had uh, allegedly breached her settlement, she had to give all that money back. Uh, so in my case, they offered me a hundred grand a year for three years plus medical benefits, but I would have had to agree to a non-disparagement clause, which means I wouldn't have been able to say a single bad thing about the university. I'd be applying the rules is, you know, if you go to social media, act as if your hands are chopped off. And I know they'd be checking me for the rest of my life, looking for something, trying to get the money back. So we can get a rough idea of what it is that he might have gotten. And so basically they said, okay, well, you can do your research. We just don't want this associated with UNB. Uh, so that's three examples then of um, omission. So what I forgot to mention is uh, there was complete silence from the union, so we didn't hear any public displays of support. There was no letters to the editor, uh, nothing on their website that I could see where there were any active support for their colleagues. So one method then by which you can uh, stand against academic freedom is through omission. Uh, but the other way is through commission. We actually do an act uh, that's visible to the public. Uh, so the example I'll consider there is that of Jen Smith, who was a speaker at the University of British Columbia. So I want to make sure I get the details correct here about Jen Smith. So Jen Smith is a biological male uh, who's transgender, uh, but asked to be addressed as he, so in terms of uh, pronouns. Okay. And so in terms of Jen Smith and what was it that was so, in quotes, controversial, is that uh, Jen Smith has been speaking out against transgender ideology being taught in our uh, universities, elementary schools, and high schools. And so the, the general idea is that, to give you the background with us all means, is that for 99.5% of us at birth, we can easily tell that you're male or female. Uh, but for roughly a half percent, uh, would have a condition known as gender dysphoria, where they might not be sure about uh, their gender. So what makes that uh, condition very complicated then to diagnose is that you have to rule out other uh, psychological conditions such as autism, depression, anxiety, and a whole host of others. So those are the first is trying to rule out to make sure it actually truly is gender dysphoria. And then when it comes to treatment, uh, somewhere in the range of at least 60 to 80 percent, if not more, end up um, staying with their biological sex. So usually it might, the common uh, theme might be that it's homosexuality or some other problem. So given the low prevalence in society and the complications for treatments, it really needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. And so what Jen Smith is arguing is that if someone's in the class and says, uh, you know, I feel like I'm a girl, we don't just accept it and start giving them hormone treatments and whatnot. So that's what Jen Smith has been arguing against. 
And so in uh, Jen Smith's case, uh, the union, the faculty association at the University of British Columbia actually released a letter saying that the Jen Smith should not actually be allowed to speak at the university because this is hate speech that's being promoted. Uh, so in this case, uh, UBC actually decided to allow Jen Smith to speak. And because of that, the consequence then, if you want to view it that way, was that they were banned from the Pride Parade because of the, they allegedly hosted this transphobic speaker. And um, so as it says here, they, they hosted an event by Jen Smith, who's banned can who, yeah, who they say is campaigning against gender inclusive education resources. Okay. And so you could always argue, was it necessarily a good thing or a bad thing that they were banned from Pride? That could be an issue for uh, discussion. Okay. Uh, so now going to um, my case. So in terms of uh, facts to know about employment law, I think a lot of people think, well, if you're a tenure professor, they would never uh, fire you. And that actually is uh, false. So anyone who's in any position can be dismissed at any time. So if you think you're in a private company, the new boss comes in, they have their rules. If you don't like them, you're welcome to leave. And that actually applies for tenure professors as well. So the two ways you can lose a job is for cause. So you've done something you know, incredibly stupid. That's an act of professional misconduct. So I think there was a case at uh, New Brunswick with a uh, professor instructor trying to offer extra credit to one of his students through, you know, by means of sexual favor. So that's a clear case of dismissal for cause. And so with something like that, you just say, here it is. We're dismissing you for cause. Get out of here and end a story. And there's no real reason for a union now to stand up for you. Uh, but if it's uh, without cause, uh, then there generally the rule that would apply, at least in the civil workforce, is that you get one month of salary for each year that you've been employed, plus some punitive damages. Uh, but in Canada, what they often do, many companies, is uh, they'll require, though, under those circumstances, that the employee sign some kind of a confidentiality agreement. And the reason for that is that uh, most workplaces don't want the word getting out of how they treat their employees. So it gives you sort of a, uh, sort of a little bit of a crash course about employment law in Canada. And so when it comes to dismissal of tenure professors, it's probably happening more than we think, and we just don't know about it. So I know within my own department, there was one uh, professor who was dismissed uh, in the 1990s. And so in terms of uh, there's talk in the hallways, and a lot of it just never made sense. So one colleague said, yeah, it was a really uncomfortable time. Uh, there was an investigation, and I was in the uncomfortable position of looking at my colleagues' exams. And so he said that, oh, well, with the exams, he was asking for students then about the names of researchers uh, in the introductory psychology class. And in the 90s, that was a very common practice. I remember as a student absolutely hating that about a lot of my courses where you read about the study, you know exactly what the finding is, what the take-home message is, then you find out that you get your answer wrong at the exam because the name it was a different name. And those ones really just always got under my skin. That's why as a professor that was something I would never do. Uh, but, I mean, to say that that's a basis now for, um, for a dismissal I think is definitely overkill. Okay. And so then there are other cases in Canada, just that I know from uh, from various people who've been quietly supporting me in the background or giving me advice. And so with the mocking that we saw for Dr. Duchesne, those all happened uh, through things like open letters, and it was actually in the public eye. And that's the same, let's say, with uh, Rebecca Tuvel a few years ago when she wrote a paper for the journal Hypatia, uh, which some considered tran uh, controversial because she'd argued that someone like Rachel Dolezal uh, who had changed race, that that's an example of transracialism, and maybe we should question this idea of white privilege, because otherwise, why would it be that a white person would change their color to black? Uh, so that one was the same kind of idea, where there's this open letter to generate a lot of controversy in the public eye. Uh, but what happened in my case, though, is that um, mobbing that I experienced all happened over emails. And so the thing with that is it's outside of the public eye. It's only in my inbox, and so it's happening silently, and most people don't know about it. Uh, so the way I was able to overcome that, though, is, um, which I'll get to at the very end, is sort of getting out of sort of the legal side so I could talk about this and then grabbing screenshots of the email so then that way it is actually in the public domain. Okay, so in terms of sort of the crash course about my career, so I started at Acadia in uh, July 2003. And so in terms of the areas of success um, would be teaching, I'd say it was by far my strongest point. 
so one is, and I'll present um, evidence for this, is that, uh, is that uh, I contributed then to the development of the neuroscience option, so that wouldn't have been possible uh, without me. Okay. Then that was sort of an early career. And then, since September 2006, I taught the first half of Introductory Psychology, so the Introductory Psychology <coughs> 1. That was when I taught every year until my dismissal. And so the thing about that course, it was one that, it was like pulling teeth in my department, trying to find someone to teach it, because when it comes to required courses, that at least back then it was viewed as these are really thankless tasks, um, who wants to do it? And can we actually put the best face forward because these are required courses and just a large number of people are taking it. So you want someone who's actually going to reflect well on the department. So then in 2010, I was then um, given another required course to teach for the department. That was uh, research methods. So basically then, from that point onwards, I was teaching all the required courses in the fall semester. So obviously, it would not have been incompetent uh, if uh, the department trusted me with its most uh, treasured courses. And in 2012, September 2012, that's when I really started to hit my stride. And in the 2016-2017 academic year, I was the recipient of two uh, teaching awards. So in the summer of 2017, that's when I started to speak out then against views that are dominant at our university campuses. And that led then to August 31st, where I was uh, dismissed. And the justification was, oh, well, there was two so-called investigations. So when it comes to workplaces, um, if you hear the term investigations, what that basically means is we're going to have someone come in, they're going to talk to all the people who dislike you, that's going to be counted as fact, and then you have to somehow argue against that if you want your job back. Or they'll say, well, obviously your colleagues don't like you, so out you go. So that's what it means by investigations. Okay, so we might ask then, well, what was, why was I investigated? What was the motivation for that? And so that actually came from a document that I found by accident. Uh, I'm doing a search on Google. I was looking for one thing, then accidentally came this, across this document, uh, which was the minutes of a meeting held by the Acadia Student Union on Tuesday, the 13th of March. And so I was just looking at the cover page, and I saw my name update on investigation into me. I was like, what is that all about? So I searched for my name. And so then They're I publishing oh, oh. photos as well as names of individual students is harassment. Is not harassment. It is harassment. It's a clear violation of the library's policy. Okay. Uh, this clearly is not harassment. I retrieved the pictures uh, from the internet or social media, and the purpose was to show the faces of my accusers. So at this stage, I've already lost my livelihood, and now I'm trying to defend my reputation. Okay, so in according to the document then, so there it says, the president then of the student union acknowledged the so-called controversy surrounding me. She noted that there was, there was a formal investigation being opened up into me, and if anyone had any concerns uh, or wanted to have their voice heard, they should talk to her. So now in terms of the motivation though here is, she also stated that the university was looking at further options to support students who do not feel safe in the classroom. So right there is a smoking gun that what this had to do with was questioning of safe space ideology in the classroom. Okay, and then the next sentence then says, yeah, she urged that council protect and respect the process as it's being conducted. So basically what that means is, well, if, uh, you know, obviously they try to get rid of one of their top professors and just fired on the spot, it's going to make them look really bad. So what this means is we have to have some kind of process to make this person really look like he's the most horrible person on the planet first. That justifies our dismissal. So that's basically what that code means. That we're going to find some kind of a smear campaign. That's also defamatory. Okay. And so that's my, uh, okay. that's my interpretation. We, we, we agree. You are doing this to a second person when we still have not heard back from the library about the first person. I don't think it's unreasonable to halt your discussion for a moment. Yeah, so this, uh, once again, is not harassment. I retrieved the pictures from the internet or social media, and the purpose was to show the faces of my accusers after my livelihood had already been destroyed, and now I'm trying to defend my reputation. So, the, again, the purpose of this talk is to defend the academic freedom of all professors, including the ones who accused me. The irony of the situation is that these individuals kept disrupting my talk in the name of safe spaces. 
However, the library had to call the police in advance of this event, and there was a police presence at the talk, and this was so that the audience would have a safe space so they could listen to what it is that I have to say. Take it back and, and okay. continue. Okay. So now we can look at what the vice president, uh, academic journal, had to say. So again, now here, she reiterated that students need to feel Second safe this. in their classroom. Okay. And then in addition, explained uh, that in addition to the independent investigation, that there was an investigation being done under the collective agreement. So what she's referring to then is this document here, which uh, is an agreement now between the Board of Governors at the universities, so the administration, and the Faculty Association. So that's the union. So then if there's an investigation being done under the guise of the collective agreement, by definition then, this means that there's going to be a, a collusion or agreement now between the two parties. And the key point is that this is already well underway in March, uh, but I wasn't giving any notification of this verbally until May, and I had no idea an actual report was written until just about time when it was going to be used for, my, uh, for the discipline, which you can see in the letter that, was, that these um, uh, fine folks have uh, circulated. Okay. And so then we might ask, well, what's safe? And I brought before the idea with Derek Pine is that you're questioning someone's power. So if we want to understand then the idea of safe spaces, uh, what we need to understand is the power structure uh, within the university. Okay. And so uh, I mentioned at the start then that one of, my, um, one of the achievements I'm proud of is my contribution to the neuroscience option. Uh, so this is a letter that Dr. Bader wrote for me way back in 2005. Uh, so I put the whole paragraph so you have the full context, but the part that's most important is what's in uh, yellow, which I've highlighted. So in the area of teaching, it was noted that Dr. Mehta has performed at a high level consistently. This is evident in his strong course evaluations across a wide variety of courses, including courses that are required and less preferred by students. So this is, of course, like research methodology, the second half of introductory psychology, so those ones. It was also noted that course enrollments and physio like physiological psychology have increased markedly since Dr. Mehta began teaching it, a testament to his ability to engage students uh, in the classroom. Okay. So the key point then here is, and that was what was established at the meeting, was if it wasn't for me teaching the physiological psychology course, there would not have been the enrollment. So once I started teaching, enrollment went up. And so now there was a justification. There was like, oh, okay, there's all, all this interest in these courses on the neuroscience side of psychology. And so that this is 2005. In 2006, then, we had the hiring of Dr. Randy Newman. And then in 2009-2010 academic year, uh, there was a committee that was formed to uh, develop the neuroscience option. Okay, so what's nice then, uh, what, something, a factor that worked in my favor is before my dismissal, the year before that, uh, the department had a program review. And so within that program review, there was many documents. What was most relevant is that included everyone's uh, CVs or their resumes. So it has everything you need to know about them professionally. So in terms of Dr. Bader, one thing about her is that she got a Cout Dedicated Service Award. So Cout is the larger union to which my union belongs. So basically all the unionized faculty belong to this one large um, organization. And so she got a Dedicated Service Award in January 2016. And so there's a little write-up explaining why is it that made her so award-worthy. And so the sentence I found quite telling was one where it said, well, I'm telling you, you could not have asked for a more courageous defender of equity. So again, this is now referring to equality of outcomes, not equality of opportunity. Okay. Uh, so now if you look at the program review, what's interesting is you can find out a lot about people and uh, what's in their professional career and what they value. So of course she was department head at the time I left from 2016, and I think until when I, till I was my dismal soul and currently now. Uh, but in her own um, submission now for the program review, she says she has several leadership roles within the union, including a senior grievance officer. That means then you know the contract, the social this contract, the collective agreement inside and out, what you can get away, what what, what you can't. So uh, so you know it's definitely the details of this inside and out. Uh, she was on negotiating teams multiple times then to establish what's actually in the contract. And in the, then as finally, she was also president of the union just uh, before I was uh, speaking out. 
Okay. Uh, then another person who was on the uh, Neuroscience Development Committee uh, was Carmen Bliley. So she too has a Couch Dedicated Service Award, although it didn't give any reasons for it. And so from the program view, what I found interesting is that she too had extensive service with the union. And so again, we see the word equity coming up. So the Employment Equity Committee, uh, as well as other committees that, uh, that monitor like who's being uh, hired, like the university appointments. And she also worked at the junior level uh, as a grievance officer. So again, has a good working knowledge of how the collective agreement works. Okay. And then finally, the third then, this person I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Randy Lynn Newman. And so what's noteworthy about her is that she's been featured now in the camp, uh, university's campaign under the category of exceptional teaching and engagement. And of course, the goal of the campaign is to use um, fundraise a lot of money, in this case, $12.4 million. Okay. Uh, so when I was looking through her, um, her, her resume that she submitted for that, there was a couple things that stood out. So in her teaching awards, uh, she said that she'd gotten an Acadia Student Union Teaching Leadership Award in 2017. So that struck me as very odd because I got one, you know, I got two awards that year. I was at the dinner, I didn't hear her name called, I didn't see her name on any list or anything like that. There was no announcement. So that struck me as very strange. Now it's possible that just could have been a typo or some kind of error. Maybe that's all that happened. It, it was in fact but, the rest of that document. Uh, but then uh, she also listed having had an, an associate alumni of Katie University Distinguished Faculty Award in 2016. And that is true, but what had happened was, I remember in 2017 in the summer uh, that we were working on some other document, and I had to, and I complained and said, wait a minute, why is this listed at 2017 when she got it in 2016? I was told, okay, yeah, you're right. So that's, um, I guess, two pieces of information. That's a bit Okay, and then in terms of service. That was a typo from a different thing. It was not uh, Randy herself presenting. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so I continue on then. If we look at service, uh, now, again, we see the word equity come up. So she's on the Pay Equity Committee, also strongly involved with various women's groups, so the Women in Science and Engineering, Gender Studies Programming, the Women's Committee at the uh, union level. So we kind of see, a, I guess, a theme here coming across uh, these three people, what they have in common, in addition now to formulating the neuroscience option. So now we can ask ourselves, now given the power structure, we can ask that question, well, why is it that people felt unsafe because of me? So in terms of the starting point, where I'll put it is in 2017, just closer to events leading to the dismissal. So what's interesting about the 2016-2017 academic year uh, with Dr. Badur was that she wasn't teaching any courses that year. So she had course releases from being department head, as well as course releases from being union president. And so then that was a little suspicious. You see, okay, what is this person actually doing with their time? So you know they're in meetings and on emails and things like that, but you're not really getting a sense of what actually is going on. Uh, so rather than going on what I did see, I'll talk about what I did not see. So when uh, the whole controversy started with Jordan Peterson and he was standing up against Bill C-16, well, I just thought, okay, well, we have someone who's a colleague in the department in psychology. Uh, how come this is not being discussed at any of our department meetings? I thought that for sure would be a logical place. And I thought, well, uh, this is also an academic. This is an academic freedom issue. How come our union isn't standing up? And so there's on both fronts, and something really just did not sit right. And so I was wondering then, well, wow, where's Cout in all this? Where is uh, the Canadian Psychological Association? Where's the Canadian Society for Brain, Behavior, and Cognitive Science? So a lot of things just did not sit right, and I started to wonder what is actually going on. Okay, and then when it came to the awards that I got, uh, it was documented inside the, the career, you know, the annual performance review that you're required to do. And the tone of that meeting was, well, if I have to do this, I'll document it. But it wasn't a sense of like, you know, joy when I told her I'd have the awards. So something about that really felt like it was really not right. So something just didn't feel right, uh, e even at that stage. I do not dispute okay. your objective uh, feeling about that, but your department did not have habit of announcing awards in general at department meetings. Okay, and so now we, what happened in the summer of 2017 then is that uh, near the end I spoke out uh, against my union during contract negotiations. Uh, so the reason for that was, I, had, I mean, I had concerns. The main one that really got under my skin was that our union was uh, on the verge of going on strike for pay raises. I didn't feel it was ethical to do that because 
uh, other, uh, our support staff had taken pay cuts in the past. So that was something that really got under my skin. And then there was the one person else who, when I asked about that, you know, he said, you know, our job is to make demands, theirs is to give into them. And someone else then was actually just outright dismissive then about my concerns. So on August 1st, I sent out an open letter. And in terms of the uh, critiques I made, so basically it was one about the attitude then about uh, money when it comes to our support staff. So why, why are we demanding all this money when they take pay cuts? Uh, the other two had to do with methodological. So we had these really biased surveys where it's clear they're looking for results, which I, I, I thought were these leading questions. Uh, how they were uh, interpreted, especially the written comments. It seemed like it was just cherry-picked comments that were given out. And then lastly, that when it came to the meetings, uh, you couldn't uh, provide an alternative perspective. So I suggested, why don't we just use a blind hiring process? And the meeting continued as if I hadn't even spoken. Okay. And so in terms of that, um, generally the response is, I got a lot of private messages to support for various reasons. And, uh, but there was only one that actually said that was actually outright hostile. And so the key thing about that letter, if anyone's reading it, is that there's no names identified on that. So you can't tell who anyone's referring to, I'm referring to. Uh, but it reads very differently, though, if you're strongly involved with the union. So if you think you're a department head, you've been on the, um, all these committees, you played a role in formulating the contracts, it's going to read very differently, and it's going to feel threatening. And so uh, the next day, I got an email from one of my colleagues, who I think of as sort of the second command in the department. This is also department. violating privacy of patrons. Uh, so in terms of this email that uh, the colleague Diane Holmberg sent me uh, was that one where she accused me of, uh, um, of making a public accusation against the department head, and there was, her name was never actually in it, so there was no public accusation anyway. And so then here she said well, I, uh, that I was making the accusation when I wrote the sentence. I also would not be the least bit surprised if I will start to have a record of deficiencies appear in my employee file, even though there has been no cause for concern during my first 14 years at... Acadia. Uh, so that was just a statement of how I sort of feel like this is how the direction is going based on me speaking out. But here I'm being accused of, uh, but so that's basically I thought, oh, things are not going to be looking good. But I did not actually name the department head. So she said, that, uh, Dr. Holmberg was the one who said I accused her of that. Okay. Which is true. And so then uh, if we go on, uh, she says now, to make matters even worse, the equity officer, though admittedly you didn't ask her to, has publicly weighed in with a promise to protect you against potential, now in quotation marks, harassment and discrimination. As if that's somehow a bad thing, that if I'm being harassed, that I can report it and get people to stop. Uh, so what's interesting then is that our equity officer ended up resigning on how, because of the way the university handled my case, and uh, two union reps actually resigned from their positions yeah, as well, right. based on which I'd argue based on how the union handled my case. And so what I find interesting is the last one is, um, uh, please stop what you're doing before you damage reputation further, not, not least your own. So I think basically my interpretation of this email message was one like, get in line, otherwise we are going to get rid of you. You're and if you look at the research on, um, right. on mobbing in the right. workplace, uh, what's interesting is it talks about how usually what happens is the dissenter speaks out against someone who's in power and then everyone else then gathers then around that person. This is very, very textbook uh, workplace mobbing. And so I think at that point, everyone thought, OK, this will be it. We scared him. He's going to pipe down and quiet down. Uh, but instead, I started to ramp things up. And, um, and basically, what, the way this works is you know, I would say something. If someone sees it, you know, if people think this is just a village idiot. You're just going to discount it. You're not going to pay any attention. But if someone sees it as threatening, they will respond. So that's how I'll say is here's the action, now here's the reaction. So in September, roughly actually about a year at this time, I did a talk on free speech in which I was critical of many things about the university, including the women's group and of Acadia committing itself to the political ideology of social justice. And so our esteemed colleague here sent out an email message in a public forum in which she uh, questioned my academic integrity uh, so basically saying it was the first violation of academic integrity that she had ever seen at Acadia. And what's interesting about that is that she had this long uh, tirade. And so I just looked at the first point and said... Which kind of questions my yes. uh, 
So the first point she'd raised was that there was no references, which is another point she mentioned here. And I said, actually, there are, I circulated a document in advance that contained 20 pages of references. So if that's your strongest argument, then have a nice day. Uh, so then another person who complained is uh, uh, Cynthia Bruce, who's now actually our current union president and was supposed to be handling my settlement. So what I found interesting is uh, who this she is wrote it to. This is a violation of privacy oh, as well as more yeah, so, um, defamation. Yeah, so she sent it not just to me, uh, but also to the dean, Jeff Hooper. And so here's an interesting tidbit about um, employment law that I didn't know before, is that if you're in a dispute with a colleague, and if you copy your uh, boss on that, that's your way of saying to the boss, discipline them. So I had no idea about, about that at the time. So it seems strange, though. Why is she emailing, ceasing the dean on this? And then even more strange is why is she ceasing Randy Newman, who's with the women's groups? It just seemed like that's irrelevant. I couldn't make heads or tails of that. And so then in her email to me, she makes various uh, accusations. And if anyone watches the talk or who was there, they'd know that these are all false accusations. So saying that my anti-equity and anti-social justice stance is disturbing that I'm dangerously so close to advocating for oppression, that I'm working to silence these so-called marginalized groups, and that I'm advancing human rights violations. So these are all false accusations. If you want to talk about defamation of character, I'd argue that this is what this is in, in this email message. Okay. Uh, then in the fall of 2017, I was critical of a graduate thesis uh, because it was based on interpretive dance. Okay, so what had happened was there was, uh, was having a Facebook exchange with a, with a student. And so in the second part, I said to him, well, if you disagree with what I'm saying, I recommend that you go to New Real Peer Review on Twitter and see what counts as scholarship these days. Again, and I if you think that seriously uh, object to your uh, giving photos and names of former oh. students. Right? Okay. You, can, you can critique your former colleagues. Oh. We are in a position of equal power to you but using your position as a faculty member to harass students is oh. unconscionable. No, oh, but I'm not a faculty member. Okay, so anyway, it says then, uh, if you think that the research on this page wouldn't take place at Acadia, then go to the following link and tell me how this uh, award-winning thesis uh, can be uh, can be a, somehow reflects well on the Faculty of Arts it's or the School of Education. Yeah, okay. All right, so in terms of the thesis then, so basically I said what was on this uh, graduate studies website then is that the student received this award, and so in terms of the title, it's called an auto-ethnographic -ethno um, exploration of my sexual identity as seen through interpretive dance. So what autoethnography means, it's just basically a diary entry in which you add references. So there's not really much um, critique or analysis or anything like that on that. that and so in terms of why I got the award then, the reviewers commented on the depth of Tyler's writing and how he used dance as in integral to the research and not as an add-on. So the idea is because the research was actually focused on this interpretive dance, then that's what makes it uh, award-worthy. And so when you read the thesis, it's just based on the one-person experience. There's no attempt to try to maybe see how this might apply to other people, because maybe there is actually something to this interpretive dance. But there was no attempt at that. It was, uh, like me, I just saw it as this exercise in narcissism. That's a okay. And so in terms of that, um, eventually I ended up getting a, le um, a message from the dean, because I thought I was going to have an interview. I let the students in one of my classes know. That student sent the email to the dean. And so then he said, during our meeting, so basically what happened was he came to my office and asked me to take, that, um, take down that link to the Research Graduate Studies website. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And I asked, like, why do you want it down? He said, well, uh, by posting that link there, uh, you, could be, you, you could be seen as minimizing uh, his coming out experience. And then that would then in turn be violating the university's policies on homophobia. And so I said, that's the stupidest thing I've heard. If you're worried about that, change the policy then, because I'm just, I'm just exercising my academic freedom. And so then a bit of a kerfuffle arose, and he left storming, and I then took to Twitter right away. So then over here then, we fast forward to this day, and he sends an email. And so he said, during our meeting, I repeatedly stated that I recommended that you consider taking this post down. I never directly asked you to take it down. In fact, I even went further and informed you that I was not in a position to, to ask that this be removed. It was simply my recommendation. 
So it's uh, interesting about that sentence and why I have that uh, text box uh, highlighted like that is that when it came to the discipline meeting, which uh, actually she was kind enough to give you the letter and we were discussing then that letter, when I ended up reading that sentence back to him, um, it was clear it got under his skin and there's been no, little to no mention of him since then. So basically when you say one thing in one context and you have something written in other contexts, I think by most people's definition, that's what we'd call a lie. And so once you're caught in a lie like that, your credibility is gone. So, I, so that's, I guess, a point that I'll build on later on, is remember that one, one concept. Okay, so then in fall 2017, I was critical of an article on gender inequities that was published in our student newspaper. And so then I got an email shortly after that from Glennis Gibson, who's in the biology department, and also a member of the Women in Science and Engineering group. And almost uh, like a reflex, she has the because it's 2015 quoted at the bottom, which was the justification our prime minister gave for his uh, gender balanced cabinet. This is also so what's interesting is she sent it not just to me, uh, but copied it on the vice president academic. So I didn't know at the time what she's saying is discipline him. Uh, so what I found interesting about her criticism of me is uh, putting a student in a position of potential risk is not okay, neither is it free speech, as you could have easily made your points about women in science and engineering without naming the student or even referring to the article, which I'd say is ridiculous. It's hard to critique it if you can't even refer to that. And yes, I am a member of Wise Acadia. I'm proud of that. But even if I was not, I would still be concerned about the direction this is taking. So I'd argue this is sort of the early steps that people are saying, okay, I feel threatened by what you're saying. If this doesn't stop, we are coming after you. Okay. And then uh, sort of in the Christmas break, I was critical of the Me Too movement on Facebook. Um, and so one student who got particularly irate about that was one uh, Veronica Oliver. We had a, quite a heated debate because I was talking about issues like due process and how the sources that she was talking about were biased, like the hunting ground where it's a documentary where 20 professors from the School of Law at uh, Harvard had denounced it on using dubious statistics, things like that. And um, so I know afterwards that she complained and tried to get out of my course. And her name, her name and face will come up a few times. Uh, at the beginning of 2018, I sent an email message to the, in a public forum in which I was critical of the decolonization program at Acadia and its implications then for academic freedom. So, uh, so if you're worried that no matter what you say, it's going to infect certain people, then by definition, that's going to limit what you're going to do in the classroom. And so the response that I got from the Dean of Arts, Jeff Hennessy, what's interesting about that is that that same that response would have got him dismissed on the spot had that same email exchange occurred in the private sector. And that's not just me saying that, that's actually from the, arguably the top employment lawyer in Canada, Howard Levitt, who wrote that um, in the uh, Financial Post. Okay. So then in 2018, early in January, I sent out a tweet to Andrew Scheer in which I said to him, how is it that you can say that you're for free speech, yet remove Senator Bayak from your CAC caucus, the Senate caucus, um, just for posting letters on our website. So if you're saying then that we're going to hold indigenous people from a, to a different standard than the rest of us, that's bad for race relations. And so that was uh, what hit the newsstands uh, early January. And from there, I could see there was definite change in the work environment. And all the signals when I look back in res retrospective is, yeah, the decision's been made. We're going to get rid of him. And it's just sort of the how or when. I think the game plan is, okay, let's see what we can do to get under his skin. Hopefully he'll do something stupid. And we say, aha, see, you did something stupid. That's our basis for dismissing you, you know. So let's say swearing in the hallways or something like that. If I recall my timeline correctly, that was also after you had tweeted support of a literal And so in terms of um, the first thing that happened was I'd lost courses that I've been teaching for years. So uh, I mentioned how I taught all of the required courses in the fall semester. And so in the second semester, what's here then are the ratings then for the introductory psychology two, so two sections, uh, research methods two, and also an introductory psychology one that's offered in the second semester. So then there's more courses in the second term than the first, but the key point I guess I'll highlight is that my sample sizes in general are larger. Okay, so the next thing looking at the table then is that if you look at my numbers, uh, those are all consistently higher than what we see in the second semester. And so when I was making this table for the appeal of my teaching allocations, 
I noticed that, wow, if there's something weird about this last column, so why is it that the numbers go up so dramatically? Okay. And so one thing I thought is I'll look at is, is the introductory psychology one being offered in the second semester? And it was for every year except this last one. So now we're on uh, equal footing where there's going to be two, instruct two instructors in the second semester and only me for the first semester. Okay. So then I asked, okay, well, who's teaching the second half of introductory psychology? And so it was one person all along, but suddenly when Simmons is not teaching the second half of introductory psychology, these numbers go up quite uh, strikingly. And he was the one who then ended up teaching that course after I was uh, dismissed. So and so then you might ask about two... Career, uh, data and student evaluation numbers of the Yeah, and so we might then ask data. then... Okay, well, uh, who got the research methods one? And that person was Re uh, Randy Newman. So what I found interesting about her then is she was on leave on this first year here, the 2012-2013 academic year. I think it was a sabbatical. And then when she came back, what I noticed is there's very little increase in the average um, responses, those mean averages. So there's very little increase. So what I think that can tell us then is the reason these numbers increase so dramatically then is actually then to, to shampoo and not Rick, this the is other ones. Also a privacy violation. Okay. Uh, so now in terms of academic freedom issues. So we can ask then in the introductory psychology course, uh, what was it that I did wrong? What was the reason for the complaints? So one thing about introductory psychology textbooks is much of the information is outdated or actually outright wrong. And uh, especially in the second half, where many of those effects just don't replicate or they're just outdated or just outright wrong. And so in terms of a constitutional right to freedom of conscience, I just could not with a clear conscience teach material that I know to be wrong. And so that was my reason then for going off, in quotes, off script. That's not a constitution. And so uh, we can ask then, what was it that I did that was, um, uh, that ruffled feathers? <coughs> So uh, what I'll go into is the units and only the classes where I went off. So most of the class was your traditional introductory psychology to class, but there were certain sections where I went off the traditional script. Uh, so one was then looking at sex differences. So the idea is that if we have sex differences between men, you know, these differences between women and women, uh, we also see them in intelligence as well as other areas. Uh, that might then uh, translate then into things like the jobs they earn and in terms income. Can we evaluate maybe the validity of this premise? And that was one where this class where there was an outburst by the student Veronica Oliver, uh, saying that I was in quotes the denying the wage the gap. Photo in respect to a comment on your public Facebook post is one thing. Talking okay. about the students. Uh, okay. The and so then another. Or interactions with. And so then another issue I went into then is asking about disparities in price. income among various ethnic groups, and that might be actually better explained then by economics as opposed to systemic discrimination. And the source I cited that uh, was Thomas Sewell, who's a very well-respected black economist. So he's, I think, roughly 89 now. Uh, apart from being a very prolific um, economist, he's been also, he has a lived experience, and he's spoken extensively about things like how the black community has had a real disservice by universities holding them to a lower standard when it comes to uh, allowing them into the top tier universities. And you talked then about how the welfare state is probably a better explanation for poverty in the black community than this systemic discrimination. Okay. Uh, when it came to the section on human development, so this I talked about before, so I won't do it again here, but I talked about uh, some of the complications when it comes to uh, diagnosing and then trying to treat uh, gender dysphoria. And uh, that was what got me the label of being transphobic. Uh, I also showed some videos uh, with Christina Hoff Summers and Camille Paglia, um, which they were uh, critical of the role of feminism in our education system. And so in that class, that was one where Veronica Oliver screamed out that by showing those videos, I was somehow endorsing rape. And four days after that class, so that happened on a Friday, uh, the following Tuesday, that's when I got the notice from the vice president of academics saying that I was in, being, in quote, investigated. So at that point, it's, as I said, we're going to come after you, we're going to talk to everyone who dislikes you, and that's what we're going to use as evidence against you. Okay. Uh, so then in the social behavior, in that chapter, uh, there I present information, views that were critical of uh, movements like Black Lives Matter. I also uh, presented views from various uh, black uh, commentators, 
like an Antonio Okafor, Candace Owen, Larry Elder, Josephine Matias. Basically, they find their commentary about why it is that there is such uh, rampant uh, poverty within the black community. And on the indigenous side, I presented uh, the views of Clarence, Chief Clarence Louie, uh, who's the chief of a, the Osoyoos brand in uh, South Okanagan, BC. And so he's one who says that if you really want to preserve your culture, uh, prosperity is the way to doing it. So stop you know, whining about these things that happened one, 200 years ago. Uh, just go do your job, come on time, put in a good effort, get a good, good hard day's work, and do that and build over time, and eventually you will build. And so uh, he's been credited as a savings bank from going into bankruptcy, and so they do things like run wineries and whatnot. So they're very successful. And so he says, if you want to succeed in life, what you need is a strong work ethic. And so then the last point I mentioned then was that hate is often taught in our education system. And so in terms of a visual, I said just walk around uh, the university and you can see it firsthand. So if you want to get someone onto your side on a disagreement, probably speaking into a bullhorn is probably not the best way of doing it. It's probably best to have a civil dialogue. Or here, saying slower minds keep right. I think obviously it's uh, against anyone who has any kind of view that could even remotely be considered conservative. And so I said, if you really want to be able to resolve these issues of uh, hate that we're seeing in society, the best thing to do is reach out to people who are different from you and try to actually you know, have a conversation. As and so as an example, the there is uh, Daryl Davis. Um, that was not so, really yeah, and so he... Um, to everybody who was intending to be a bad event. Yeah. So the, he did... Um, so what, what's uh, interesting about Daryl Davis, and it's covered in the uh, documentary called Accidental Courtesy, is that he was interested in the question of how is it that people can hate me when they don't even know me. And so then he started reaching out uh, to white supremacists, like actual real KKK members. Eventually they became friends, and over time, over 300 of them end up giving up their robes and saying, ah, clearly there's something wrong here. And so this was the way then of resolving hate, and this is very consistent with what Martin Luther King talked about back in the 60s. Okay, and so... Uh, when, when I was doing that section, uh, there were people who were protesting and leaving the class, and one person rudely screamed out, you know, next time try teaching psychology. And at that point, I had more than enough of uh, my patients, and it started to run out. So when the chapter started on uh, psychological disorders, I started off by saying that if you really want to see what it looks like, just look at your peers in this classroom. And so I started off by giving the averages for the psychology majors and the non-majors. And what I found interesting was that the psychology majors were actually performing consistently lower than the non-majors, and that this discrepancy was more pronounced in the morning than in the afternoon, which is where we had most of these um, disruptions. And so then I commented then that with those group of students and their, the way they were acting in the classroom was very much in line with uh, how cults behave. So just the general idea is that... Uh, if, someone, if someone's foolish enough to believe absurdities, they're at high risk now committing atrocities. And so there I cited the Jonestown murder massacre. My only um, regret is not also talking about uh, the Charles Manson, because with the Jonestown, it was aggression against the self, whereas with the Manson, it was aggression against others. Uh, and least let's say that didn't go over too well with some people. That was not to make me the most popular. Harassment and a violation of privacy for a student. And then finally, the last thing I did was at a honors thesis conference, there were some really bad presentations that day. Uh, I mean, I was actually embarrassed to be a member of the department. It was it was that level of embarrassing. And so um, afterwards, I got this uh, uh, when it was time for a discipline meeting. I asked, you know, I was adamant about asking for copies of the complaints. So this was the one complaint that I actually did receive a copy of. And so what's interesting about that then is how does a student know to send it to this many people? So usually when students have a complaint, they might try to reach maybe the admin assistant or maybe the professor or a head. But how does a student know to send that many people all at once? So that was one th the first thing that struck me, uh, that really struck me. Uh, then the second one, then, is that um, I'm submitting a formal complaint. This is not the first formal complaint that I've filed against Dr. Mehta. Furthermore, all of my previous complaints have gone unanswered. So that begged the question, then, okay, I'd like to see these other complaints, and why are those ones ignored, and what's so special about uh, this one? And that was a question, and I never got an answer to that. And so then, in terms of what was it that she found so... Um, 
uh, like what was the motivation for sending this then, was that I, I exhibited extremely inappropriate behavior during her thesis presentation. Uh, so the behavior, the behavior, if you want to call it extremely inappropriate, uh, was a reflex. It was just eye rolling and giggling to what I thought was just inherently stupid and absurd. So that was my extremely inappropriate conduct. And so she was um, concerned about that, that I ex exhibited the behavior during her, th her presentation, but not in the presentation of the other students. And that false, because I also exhibited the same behavior in the other presentations too, because some of those were also just as stupid. So that part is actually false as well. Okay. Uh, oops. And then, in terms of why, you can tell just by the thesis title. Uh, so, the impact of short-term STEAM engagement on girls' self-efficacy, belongingness, and career aspiration. So, one of the things you learn in a first-year course, and she would have, because she took three courses with me, is that correlation does not imply causation. And so, this was a study where people weren't randomly assigned to groups. So, you can't use a term like impact, and that's just from the title. And from there, it just got worse when you actually look at the, the details of the study. So what was interesting about this was that I received an email that I wasn't supposed to because with the dean, he was like, hey, you want to copy the complaint? Fine. So he sent me a file, not realizing that there was an email there that I was not supposed to see. And so I talked to you before how I suspected that there was something up with my department head. And so now here, this is, I think, next smoking gun, is seeing the email that I was not supposed to see. So hello all. In response to Callie's email, I want to say that this situation was 100% predictable, and I continue to be frustrated that Rick Mehta has been left in a position of authority over students for many months as things continue to escalate. We know what the risks and consequences are for students, and I personally have expressed them on numerous occasions, and yet nothing has been done to minimize the impact of the, sit the situation while formal channels are being pursued. So this kind of confirmed what I suspected all along, that there's something happening here, and I'd love to be able to see what else is in the uh, outbox for my former colleague. Okay, so that's basically what happened over that uh, last academic year. Then for the longest time, things stayed quiet. Then suddenly, uh, the union's lawyer asked to meet with me to sign this document, uh, which he said was uh, specially for me. And what's interesting about the document was he spent two hours trying to get me to sign it, and I said, no, I'm not going to. Uh, but then the union went ahead and signed it anyway, and this is actually considered valid in the eyes of labor law, which seems strange, because normally if you see a contract and there's room for three signatures, but there's only two, normally we would not think of that as a valid contract. But in labor law, this would be considered valid. And so the only other areas I can think of where this could happen is when parents give consent for their children, you know, to go to field trips or things like that. Or let's say if I was looking uh, after someone who's elderly and they've given me power of attorney. So I think this speaks volumes then about how unions uh, see their members. So they're basically children that need to be herded in, in, in essence. So they don't look at unions as members who have their own autonomy and viewpoints. Okay, so I won't go through a step-by-step -step of everything that's here. Uh, but basically the first part where they had the whereases uh, is what the two parties agree as fact. So that's what we can kind of ascertain when we look at this, um, at this picture, is that the two parties are in agreement uh, on the various facts. And so the key idea is when it comes to a contract is never sign it if there's even one thing wrong. So if there's more than one thing, of course, don't sign it. So what I'm presenting here is that tells us the motivations about what their union and the admin's game plan was. And so this clause here, basically what it says is that the parties agree to expedite all issues uh, related to me. Uh, so that basically says, okay, we want to get this done quickly. Okay, and so that's what they agree is with, as fact. And then this is sort of what they agree is the game plan on how to proceed. And so this was a section, because I sent that agreement to two lawyers, and both of them expressed concern about this one clause here, where they said it was a gag order. So basically, um, this tells us then that they wanted to get rid of me uh, quickly and quietly and that they wanted me to be a part of that. And that was something I obviously did not consent to. But I think with other people, when they're under the pressure and you have a lawyer coming at you like that, where they would give in. So that, I think, was ended up being one of my saving graces here in this dispute. And so in terms of what's um, uh, in the McKay uh, report, uh, what I found interesting from an academic perspective or having a science background is in a science bag with a science paper, you see an abstract that gives a summary. There's an introduction. 
than the methods to explain what happened, the idea someone else should be able to replicate and get the same results, uh, then you know, your results and conclusion. Uh, this one didn't actually have an executive summary. So this is like going to a science article and there's no abstract. So what did you do and what did you find? There's no way to know. And then there was no method section. So that's like reading a science paper that doesn't tell you what the procedures were and what did you do. And so it was interesting reading as um, the McKay report and seeing a section saying, yeah, to be fair to Dr. Mehta, but then it's like I'm asking myself, well, what exactly did you do to be fair to me? And there's no explanation. So in terms of looking at the appendices then, as we can see that uh, everyone within my department was a complainant against me, uh, uh, pretty much everyone. So there's one colleague, and she was in the Hooper report, which basically in the end they're not looking at. Uh, there was one person whose name was anonymous in this report, uh, but then when I looked at the other report, his name, his same interview was not anonymous, and that was Doug Simmons. Is this harassment okay. And then in terms of other complainants, uh, in terms of faculty members, well, it's interesting that there was one member from the, from the Board of Governors who's in the School of Education, another person from the School of Education I've been critical of, who's now also the current union president, our esteemed guest over here, uh, the coordinator of the Women and Gender Studies program, the person who was signed to be my head, uh, because he had, in quotes, administrative experience. And then there was one person whose name was redacted, but based on the content, I'm willing to bet that that was uh, Glennis Gibson, who sent that threatening email to me earlier. Well, and so, so in terms of... And yeah, and so now we can look at the notable students who complained. And so there probably aren't too many surprises here. These are faces you've probably seen before the president of the union, uh, the student whose uh, thesis I degraded. Disturbing harassment uh, and defamation as well as uh, the, the, student the privacy of students. Yeah, the student who had the outburst in class and the uh, editor of the student newspaper. So those are probably, I guess, the, probably the most noteworthy from a whole list. And so this is my letter of, um, of dismissal. So this is the actual letter, not what was circulated. What was circulated to you is what was discussed. And what was interesting about that discipline meeting but well, even though uh, they had, uh, the decision was made, they already had all the power, I kept getting under their skin, and they were the ones who kept losing composure over and over again. So basically, there's no merit to that letter. Uh, and basically, started early on where the vice president academic was, oh, you know, maybe I'd like to take a break. And I said, ah, I don't need a break. I'm doing fine. We're taking a break. Okay, okay, fine. We can do that. So that gives you an idea of what the, how the meeting proceeded. So in terms of this letter, it basically outlines overall categories and gives that scolding tone, like, oh, you don't take responsibility for yourself, treating me as if I was some uh, kind of child. And it gives reference to the other letter, but doesn't actually give specifics, and it kind of ignores that I pretty much trashed what was in that letter in the first place. Okay, uh, so once you've been dismissed from a unionized workforce, uh, what's unique to Canada is that you have very minimal recourse if you're in a unionized workplace. Uh, so... Uh, because of a Supreme Court ruling, Weber versus Ontario Hydro, uh, that prevents employees from pursuing legal action against their employer. So that we can contrast to the states, or very recently what happened in Australia, where Peter Ridd at uh, James Cook University uh, got an award of $1.2 million. So what happened in his case was, he's a physics prof, he looked at the coral reefs and said, oh, things are pretty much fine here, there's no need for the climate alarmism nonsense that we're hearing. So he got that published, but the university wasn't happy with that. So he was dismissed, but he's managed to get $1.2 million from that. Uh, you could try doing a complaint against your union and saying, well, my union's colluding the employer to get rid of me. And unfortunately, that's not actually going to take you anywhere. Uh, so in terms of success rates for these, what are called the duty of fair representation complaints, it's uh, roughly 1% success rate at the national level. 0% uh, within Nova Scotia, and that's from a Freedom of Information request by Shannon Nickerson. So she was a part-time faculty member at the St. Mary's University, interestingly also Department of Psychology. And so she needed brain surgery, and she ended up getting harassed and then having her employment terminated. Then after that, was trying to get her union to represent her. Uh, so after that long ordeal, and you get this pretty much a standard um, it's almost like a, a template response where it says that uh, duty of fair representation doesn't require unions to make correct or good decisions. Rather, they must make decisions that are in good faith, objective, and honest. Now, the problem with that, though, is they don't have to actually give any evidence for any of that. So, uh, so if I am caught in a lie, I'm toast, but they can do that, and there's no 
uh, nothing happened to them. That's an and then the next thing is it says when the interests of the bargaining unit conflict with the interests of an individual member, the union must act in the interests of the bargaining unit. Uh, but I never saw any data showing that the, and there was an actual conflict, that there was this difference in interest. So it's just whatever they decided. Okay. And so in terms of how to proceed from there then is that you need to have some kind of a mediator or arbitrator. And so both parties need to agree on that choice. And this happens even when the two parties are on the same page. So basically from here, it's all just um, a theater show. Okay. And so you then might wonder then is if I'm up against all of this, uh, then what did I have that arguably others didn't? Uh, so it wasn't just this that was happening in my life at the time that was really, uh, that was really stressful. There was also lots of things happening in my personal life too and felt like life was falling apart. And so I'll put this um, passing, give you something as seed for thought. Uh, but when I was in a situation that bad where it felt like there was no other escape, I needed some way out, I reached then to the one place. And I'd argue this is probably what saved me over anything else is, is coming to this because it was the one source uh, that counteracted everything else. It gave me the sort of the card. It gave me an idea of where to go when I couldn't think of that myself. So we can fast forward then through a seven-month ordeal, and what basically it boils down to now is that we have two documents that contradict each other. That's basically what we have now. So in terms of my settlement then, uh, so the reason I signed it, so I had my own lawyer, and so we came up with the draft. So I mentioned then how they offered me the 100 grand a year for three years for the non-disparagement. I said, no way, I'm not taking that, because otherwise everything I'd done would have been for nothing. So then they offered me 50 grand, and I said, okay, fine, I'll take it. It's better than nothing. But I thought if I have some promise of money, it's better than nothing, and why not? But the main reason I signed it, though, was when it was originally drafted, it said, and whereas Dr. Mehta's employment was terminated for cause, and my union's lawyer scratched out the word for cause, just at terminated, semicolon, so full stop. And I thought, okay, yeah, I'm willing to sign this now. And so then afterwards, there was some alleged breach of the contract, of this uh, settlement. Uh, so now we get a ruling uh, that does, that's an exact contradiction. So the arbitration now ruling now suddenly says that um, Dr. Mehta, a tenured professor, was terminated by Acadia University for cause. So now suddenly, so there's two things about this. Suddenly the words for cause are added that weren't there originally. So that's the one inherent contradiction. Okay, and I realize this might be a nitpicky point, but when I read this uh, sentence, Dr. Mehta was terminated. It's like, no, I was not terminated. It sounds like this was a mob that went after me and my body was in the back of a car or something like that. So just that sort of wording kind of, uh, yeah, it's just not the most precise, but I, I think it speaks to labor law and the lack of standards. So basically that's where the things stand now, is that I contacted the labor lawyer and said, well, which one is this? Can you give clarification? Uh, of how, how, what we're supposed to make of that. And so I think this is probably where things are going to get interesting because I'm gonna, I want to press for having a ruling that overturns this. And it says specifically that what we mean by that then is that my employment was terminated without cause and have that actually spelled out with the real reason actually given. So that's where I think where I'm taking this legal battle. Okay. Uh, so in terms of then something to end on a more optimistic note, so I'm hoping that somehow with going that route, I can have some kind of a legal precedent there that's going to be published on Canley. And that's why I talked about this. Is, um, this is published then in Canley, and that's a database of legal rulings. So from my perspective, there's false information published about me in a legal database, and I don't want, uh, and I don't want that to be the case. I want that out. And so that's where the battle here now is for my name and reputation that's been tarnished because of the process. Okay. And then on the other hand, with Shannon Nickerson, she ended up forming um, a website called the Workplace Harassment Project. And so it's documenting various cases like mine, because there have been so many cases of people having you know, good employment records, and suddenly their employment is terminated for no good reason, and then their union side with the employer. So trying to document this. And the ultimate goal is to try to change, make a one minor change in the law that should make a big difference, which is that union members can actually have their own representation, not law, rely on the union lawyer's representation. So that, might, that seems like a workable solution from sort of the, the, two, the two ends. And so in terms of questions then for Acadia, 
is uh, I know they love their land acknowledgement so much, so I'd be deeply, deeply grateful if people would ask about that discrepancy between those two um, legal documents and ask me if the president's willing to give a dismissal acknowledgement. Uh, it would be interesting to know if uh, they'll release those reports to the, the public. Uh, I think uh, they'd be really useful for critical thinking classes to see what a proper investigation looks like versus a hit piece, because especially if you're looking at expert testimony in a courtroom, how do we know that this is a valid source? So I think it could be actually useful in that context. Um, I'd love to know how much this costed, because certainly the money has not gone to me. And general uh, questions we should ask, you know, why should public money go to Acadia if this is the way they're going to use it? Uh, for the faculty association, the union, uh, we could probably ask them how they actually informed the, uh, the membership that this is what they did and, you know, they've done this on their behalf. Have they sent a letter to the, to the membership? The okay. um, and the question is, like, how does this actually serve the interests of the membership? Did they get consent or inform them? Uh, again, how much were their legal costs? Because I know with uh, Ron Pink, uh, his rate is $600 an hour. So you can imagine then how much they must have spent on this. And it would be nice if they release other confidentiality agreements uh, as long as from the permission of the people who have been forced to sign them in the first place. Because my guess is if it wasn't consensual, then it should be released to the public. So we actually know what's happening in the underbelly of the university. Uh, so for the faculty, the question I think for them is, are they going to continue to stay silent? Uh, so that's one lesson that we've learned from history is that silence in the face of evil is compliance. And so... Um, and then for the sort of the larger question then for society at large is uh, we can ask are ideas actually being freely exchanged in that spirit of openness, honesty, and transparency within our universities or are they all committing to a political ideology? You can ask what's happening in our elementary and high schools. I think the best thing for parents is actually talk to your, your, your children or if they're university students, talk about what's asking, ask them what is it that you actually learned today, what is it that they're saying. Uh, so from there, then, we can ask, extend the conversation to the, to the teachers, ask them, what are you actually doing in your classroom? How do we hold them accountable? And if need be, uh, go higher up to areas like the school boards or even the provincial government and just say, we don't want to fund uh, our education system unless they're actually going to make our students into people who are going to be productive members of society who can engage with others in uh, open, honest, and transparent ways. So one lesson we've learned from history then is that once all of this is over, we're not going to remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. All right, so thank you. Thank you so much for having watched this video. Rather than have this be the end of the story, I want this to be the start of a new conversation. So in that spirit, I welcome comments below. Hopefully, if we engaged in dialogue that's in the spirit of openness, honesty, and transparency, we can have our universities go back to being places where all ideas are discussed and no idea goes unchallenged.